This episode of The Life After includes content warnings for sexual predatory behavior and the retelling of a racial and anti-fatness comment. During my deconstruction and divorce, somebody I grew up with in a church invited me over to his house. He was like 15, 20 years older, and he had been a camp counselor at some point. It felt like the first time that a Christian from my past had started to see me as a hurting person and not just somebody who's doubting his faith. I had come out recently and I knew that he worked with gay people, so at least he wasn't homophobic. We had dinner and he invited me upstairs to watch a video from a concert that he worked on. His name is Seth Jackson and he does the creative directing and production design for a lot of big names. And being here in St. Louis, we don't have too many opportunities to speak with somebody who has that sort of experience. But I wasn't impressed with him working with Selena Gomez or Barry Manilow or even previously with Stephen Curtis Chapman and Carmen. But when he mentioned Star Wars in concert, I I wanted to see what's up. Hell, the dude knows Anthony Daniels, a.k.a. C-3PO. While we watched the video, his hands landed on my leg. And then on my crotch. I was so uncomfortable. I didn't know that he was gay or attracted to men. He never came out. I mean, there were rumors. You know how churches are. If you're over 35 and if you have a creative job, then obviously you must be gay. But that isn't at all how I knew him. I came with some flimsy excuse and I got out of there. I remember later on texting and be like, what are you doing? That was so inappropriate. And he apologized. But the next morning, I woke up with a text that said that he wasn't going to give up on us and that he was going to make things work. I said, hell no. And and I laughed it off, but I, I always felt really uncomfortable from that situation. Months later, I started to see all of these really brave women talk about their Me Too experiences with people in power and with celebrity. I was encouraged by them and inspired by those women, so I posted about my experience. He got pissed and commented a threat to sue until a friend of mine who is a lawyer reminded him that that would not be helpful for his case. Thank you, Jake, by the way. I appreciate that. Many church people jumped to his defense. Pastor Ed Callahan, a close friend of Seth and the pastor where Seth used to serve on staff, told his church that I was lying. But something really important happened. Someone from my hometown church who I hadn't seen in over 15 years contacted me to say that Seth had done something similar to gain access to him, but when he was still a minor, and did a lot worse. But because of how church culture is, he was never really able to talk about it. and That blew my mind. Since his experience in mine, Seth had become a youth pastor and working at a university. The guy and I spoke and he agreed to go with me to speak to them. Somebody from HR met with us and said that she believes us, but since we didn't have proof and because of his situation happening so long ago, she couldn't fire him. But she ensured us that she was going to file it and be ready to move if other situations came up, and I believe her. I learned a lot in that situation about how people can use their power to gain access to others. And that's why I want to share my conversation with Emily Dukes. She had a similar experience with, if if you grew up in evangelicalism, he's a household name. And the empowerment that she has gained from telling her story and telling her experience and standing up for herself against people who have power I'll be back to share my conversation with Emily right after this. Let me kind of unpack that for you a little bit. Feeling pretty down in the pit. 
Had to lose the crew and the ship. Got a key without a grip. To frame the world, I'm ill equipped. But never again, I will submit. To groups that try to force a fit. To Emily, welcome that. to the life after. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you from? Where are you calling from? Hi, thanks for having me. So I'm currently living in Las Vegas, uh, Nevada with my partner. We've been here for almost two months, which is insane because I grew up in Georgia my entire life. I lived in a suburb uh, northeast of this city. That was my hometown. And then once I went to college, I was in Kennesaw, uh, just where, where one of the universities is. And then I moved down to a town like 20 minutes north of Atlanta. So I was never actually in the city. I went a lot um, through college, but was always in the suburbs. That's kind of how I was with St. Louis. Uh, I was in a little town 30 minutes south called Arnold. Mm, I haven't even heard of it. Well, you shouldn't, but tell me what your evangelical bringing up was like in the South. Like, I can't, I can't imagine. Yeah. Um, I mean, that that's one of the big reasons why I wanted to be out of the South and Georgia was because of the Bible Belt and because of how, like, essentially everything has Christian undertones. And I was really close to the Passion City church crew for a while. Like I went a couple of times to conferences. I actually photographed one of the conferences for the first time. Like that was a big deal that I like am photographing in an arena and like, okay. I went to those, like we're talking about like where like John Piper or Beth Moore. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. So, um, Louis Giglio would be like three feet in front of me kind of thing. I never talked with him. I was always on the outskirts of that group. Um, but I was like in deep from when I was a kid. So started out, I think my family was always Baptist. So like up until high school, we were just in a Baptist church. I had my first crush there. Um, I went to summer camp. I still remember I got my period like the first time for a month before. And like, I stained my jean shorts. I'm like fucking 12. And Oh my God. Guard me for years. Like, Ugh. So like, just imagine that is a big mouth episode. Yeah, it is. (laughs) I related to that episode so much. Too much. Yeah. Um, So like a lot of things that happened on that trip scarred me. Like I fucking remember there was a comedian who came for the first night of camp and my childhood crush then. And I were holding hands. Like I had not kissed anyone and I did it until high school. And um, he like pointed us out cause he was doing a skit and he was like, you know, that, that like bo- boy and girl over there, um, you know, it's bad for them to be holding hands in the, uh, a session of middle school church, something to that extent where he was literally fucking shameless, shaming us, shaming uh. us, everyone. And then he brought us up to the front of the room for the skit. Like I had like the deepest scars starting in middle school from evangelical church. Like I actually really yeah. loved elementary school. I was a part of Awana's. Um, I grew up homeschooled and then I went to private school, seventh and eighth grade. And then I was in a public school for high school, which is very jarring when you <laughs> like being so sheltered yeah. and having never like, um, kissed anyone or even heard cuss words. And like, I'm walking the halls in ninth grade. And I still remember walking past people and just overheard them say fuck or shit. And Oh God, this is so fucking <laughs> in my first day of ninth grade. Oh no. I wrote in Sharpie all over my arms, different Bible verses. And I went Emily. To like that. And on, I God did bless I you. I know. I know I didn't decorate my backpack that year. Um, but I think I had a pencil case and I wrote Philippians 413 or something. I like get that. it. I was the and same then, way. Yes, I, yes, yes. I'm walking in uh, empowered in the Lord. And, mm-hmm. yeah. So yeah. you just like stack on the cringiness and awkwardness of yes. middle school, high school. But then you also couple that with being like the ex homeschool kid and like in uh, in a church world, um, I was changing churches like every year by the time I hit high school, just because like oh, wow. we left the other church, I actually had a, another strange, uh, adult man and minor situation where, um, he like, I was in eighth grade and like 
this man was a deacon at the church and like had kissed my cheek multiple times and gave really long hugs. But the thing is, is he did it to fucking like two or three other girls who were in my same grade. Like it was disgusting. And I remember my parents had to change my phone number and my mom's because like he had both of our numbers and good God. Oh yeah. So, and he like was asked to leave the church and whatever, but <sighs> Um, I remember being scarred by that and my relationship with my dad has always been extremely rough and dark and a trigger for a lot of trauma and PTSD. And uh, I was looking for a father figure essentially. Um, and so I would develop like crushes on adult men because like, I, you know, of course, like it just in your body as a 13 to 16 year old, uh, cause those were the years that it was most prominent. Um, you know, I'm like already like coming into my sexuality, but then it's like, Oh, but father figure. And so I was drawn to characters and movies who had that role, especially for a young girl. Um, I wrote novels all through elementary into middle school, wrote a full length novel. And a lot of my themes in my books, as I got older were about, um, some sort of savior complex. Um, wow. I could see how those two things are related. Yeah. That's an interesting thing too, because of like how the Trinity is supposed to work, right? Where the savior archetype is, is a Jesus yeah. thing, but then also the father is God, but then they kind of culminate together because they're two and the same and everything. So that, evangelicalism in a kind of way kind of laser focus that those two kind of needs in a way um you wrote novels tell me more about mm -hmm. your interest in fiction and, and were they all christian mm -hmm. fiction or were some of them kind of outside of there how did that work so my favorite, my favorite genre to write and the one that i finished was actually more fantasy based so i had discovered lord of the rings and my best friend at the time she also wrote novels and like loved reading and all the things so we'd often get together and like write together or i loved drawing actually ever since i was a kid like I, I'm an artist now. I do photography and videography. I'm like, my hands are all over the place with creativity and I love it. And writing novels was always a part of me and just storytelling in general. And that theme of storytelling was really big for me. Um, there weren't necessarily Christian elements where I was like, you know, character praying to God or whatever. I was honestly, when I think about it, I was always pretty edgy. Um, I was still the very massive goody goody and didn't walk into a hot topic and wouldn't even look at it. Cause I'm like, it's, it's going to send me to hell kind of thing. Or I'd saw Spencer's for the first time. And I was like, this is even worse. And like avoiding it, like the plague. Um, but I also had like one of the Jesus is the light t-shirts I would have gotten from camp or something, but it's written in twilight font because twilight came out when I was like in sixth grade or whatever. <laughs> yes. So. The perfect appropriation of Christian t-shirts. Yes. Breach. Uh, uh, but then um, some other books I liked reading were these like, they were called the Christie, excuse me, the Christie Miller series. And uh, that was the first author I was just, I was absolutely in love with. And I still remember um, driving home with my dad from the mall one night, this is when I was like 12 and, um, one, uh, well, this author, I think she was going on tour or something, but you're going to have to pay money somehow to see her. And I, both my dad and I were like, who would pay like $600, you know, to come see like an author like this, like this just, do you have any celebrity that you'd do that with? And literally a year later, I discovered Ted Decker I picked up one of his books and like, this is, I'm like right at 13 and like my crush is starting to go to a different school and I'm still being homeschooled and lots going on. And I just got pulled into thriller. I fucking loved thriller and still do actually, just because I typically like the writing better. And I personally think a lot of thriller authors are better than some other authors. I totally get that. <laughs> I, I, as evangelical as I was I had a thing for goosebump books. And mm -hmm. then that grew up into kind of Ted Decker's like parallel dude. Uh, I was a big Frank Peretti fan. Um, tell me, tell me about your Ted Decker background. 
So after discovering those books, I started writing more thriller like he did. And that's when I was into like fantasy novels. I was getting into Lord of the Rings. And so I created a story based on it. It was about this assassin who was a part of this like dungeon assassin gang in the fantasy world. And they had like this warden um, who... Uh, it, trying to think of a character that would relate to this dude. He's like, he's hella sexy and he knows he is, but like, he has like a power that's very um, elusive as well as addicting. And, but he also like had a weird romantic thing going on with the main character saying all this to say, because it seems random. I had massive daddy issues as well as like being very awkward around um, like, guys my age and all of that totally um so oh were you gonna say something no well i didn't want to interrupt you because i don't want to mansplain daddy issues okay i am actually am I, <laughs> but, uh, a friend of no, mine I actually, am i using it in the wrong term like has the definition no not at all Okay. Not at all. And not your fault whatsoever. You did okay. absolutely nothing wrong. I just, I had a thought of, um, and I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'm so sorry, but okay. Jamie Lee Finch, a friend of the show, mm -hmm. I remember she had posted about the term daddy issues and it made me think Ooh. so much about how we blame girls and women for growing up with bad fucking fathers. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, oh, you've got daddy issues. No, 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 no. Their dads had fucking issues. Oh, wow. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I, and then I felt like an asshole being like, oh, Emily, stop. No. Don't I use that term that. because I need to explain. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, thank you. I'm glad you understood me. True. It's true that like. Yeah. And I immediately agree with that, actually. And I'm like, going to, I'm going to stop like using that term because like it is true. Like I've had people say like, yeah, like it's because she has daddy issues that she's fill in the blank. And it becomes this label, uh, like the sticker on the back of your T-shirt, like labeling you like all of the things like it just follows you around really close. And that's not fair because it wasn't your fault. You're in an environment that wasn't safe for you. And with people who didn't know how to help you feel safe. And then as, uh, you know, me, um, finding like this author who is really enticing and has like that bad boy esque vibe. Um, like he literally was the reason why I wanted tattoos in the first place. And now I have fucking nine and I have a full sleeve. Like that's like, that's where we're Beautiful. at. Beautiful. I love them. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, as that kid, like kind of wanting some rebellion, but being way too goody goody, uh, and like caring way too much what people thought about me. Um, I like needed other outs. So I got to meet him in person, um, when I was 13, 14, something like that. Uh, it was right before I started high school. So this is in the middle of that adult man at the church, like, uh, kissing me on the cheek. This is, um, peak, like, trauma in my family coming out and my dad being even more abusive, um, crushes, like a lot going on. So I worshiped Ted Decker. I met him five different times in person to where the last time I saw him when I was like 15 or 16, he was like, Hey, Emily, like knew my name, knew my face. I had given him a like copy, a hard book copy of my book completely done. Um, had photos with him all up in my room and he'd made this comment to me, which even like literally when I was 15, I still remember he went to hug me at one of the book signings and like whispered in my ear, you're beautiful. Um, and it said to me and my mom, I'm really curious to see, you know, where we're going to be in like five years. Like, you know, you know, you're going to be an adult or you're going to be whatever. Um, and then it always stuck with me. It wasn't an invitation to stay connected to him because I never talked with him, but I remembered it when I turned 20 uh, and I'm 24 now. I almost, I guess, five years ago, something like that, if I had my math right. And 
I reached out to his manager who also knew me uh, from the book signings and uh, asked like if there was a way that I could pass the message on to Ted or that I was interested in meeting up with him in Tennessee where he lived at the time. And uh, the manager wound up giving me Ted's email and I emailed him and he remembered me and we happened to have gone to the same concert, but like two different cities um, talked about that. And I expressed wanting to meet up with him um, for coffee. That's all I wanted. And we exchanged numbers and I talked on the phone with him. And I remember that being so insane to me, like 20 year old me, like saying a couple of cuss words and being in college and having a job and talking with the, like <laughs> the fiction lover of my life, um, who had had such a big impact and his texts, I remember were being, were really strange, um, very long. And he talked like, he talked as if he was high, but like dabbling in like the dark arts kind of thing. <laughs> like, yeah. That's an interesting combination for a Christian yeah. Uh, author, but yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, he was pressuring me to come to his house and I was like, you know, I'm actually, I, I, you actually mentioned dinner first, like, like us grabbing dinner. It wasn't like we'll grab food or whatever. Um, again, I just wanted coffee, but um, again, it was the like invitation to the house. Um, and he was like, besides Leanne, his wife wants to meet you. And it was the besides part that when I look back, I see, I'm like, if there have been ever points where I doubt what happened or feel shame or whatever that I'm feeling like if there was yes. ever a doubt, it would be that, that I was fucking pushing back being like, Hey, no, I'd actually think it'd be good to do this, whatever. And him again, pressuring. So I went, um, mm. I literally shared my location with like three or four different people That's who smart. weren't even in the fucking right. city. And, but the fact that I was doing that, knowing where I was going could be unsafe. Like, I don't even see that as a failure on my parents or even me. It was that this man who has power, let's admit this, um, has still had this like almost psychological hold over me, not because he was maybe even intentionally doing it then. I doubt that maybe he was, I don't know. Um, but it was that I was like, fuck, I get to. I'm invited to go to his house. I get to go to like where he lives, like where I know his kids like have been and sit in his office. And like, it's like the invitation to the personal. I mean, as a 35 year old now, if I was in his shoes and invited a 20 year old no, he to was my fucking house, 60, by the way, when this would have happened, like the man looks like he's young. He's literally 64. I'm not even kidding. <laughs> right. Well, you know, and there is something to be said about the power of good looking people. Right. There is a, ch they don't call it charming for nothing. Mm. Or we have to be careful around people who. Yeah. Look yeah. really I good mean, for their age or whatever, really, because. It's true. Mm -hmm. Um, but all that to say, here we are, you, Emily Dukes, age 20, being invited to a very popular author's home. And <sighs> you try to kind of balance that here's a, a a situation or here's an opportunity with here are the dangers you're sitting at your location you're not you're feeling some sort of a red flag right mm -hmm. but you also want to wow I, I don't want to pass mm -hmm. this sort of thing up right um we do need to take a break when we get back yeah. I want to hear more about what happened and what was going through your mind at that time uh, we'll be right back right after this. They say that nostalgia is a really powerful force. And now that I'm producing a Life After podcast on my own, I could use all of the help that I can get. So I went back to the drawing board and updated the show's Patreon program so I can keep the candle burning. 
On the Life Afters page on Patreon.com, you'll find several monthly contribution tiers you can choose from. Each includes digital rewards like infographics inspired by episodes, videos, sound bites, and each tier includes its own merch like stickers, mugs, posters, plus one tote bag. Find the Life After on Patreon today. You don't want to be left behind, or even left behind teen series. And keep in mind, the Life After. Find the Life After on Patreon.com and let's party like it's WoW 1999. <laughs> Welcome back. Um, Emily, what happened after you got that invitation? Mm. So I drove up to Nashville, had like a day to myself, and then I got ready to go. I still remember talking with my dad before I left that uh, what I was going to wear um, to make sure that it wasn't inappropriate. Literally, the fact that we put in this much effort to my safety obviously says that it was not safe in the beginning and we all had weird vibes about it. Um, but again, it's like, you want to go anyway, because like, as, as awkward as this sounds, like I would have dreams as a kid, like at night dreams of like meeting Ted in a coffee shop or meeting his family and going to his house. So it's like, this was a subconscious like manifestation almost from childhood that, um, you know, this person who meant so much to me, it wasn't so much that it's like, Oh, it's this. Uh, actor who is as like big as, you know, fill in the blank. Um, it was just someone who was incredibly meaningful to me. Um, That's just- totally understandable. I mean, as somebody who's had dreams of being on at night dreams of yeah. being on home improvement and lost, I get it. Same dreams. <laughs> um, um, you just, you have like the, just the desire like to meet like especially I think about the girls who were Bieber fans like and you know they had all the posters up in their room like that was me for quite a few years so I went uh he lived in a mansion at that point um it looked like a castle from the outside I texted a couple people that I had gotten there and I walked up to the door knocked and I remember being shaky oh I was talking about my dad literally like planning what I was gonna wear I was in a t-shirt and ripped jeans, like my black ripped jeans. And I had heels on because at the time I just loved wearing like these chunky heels. So he opens the door and he looks me up and down, um, like quite slow and quite oh, like seducing or like, I don't know, just being like, oh, yeah, damn, yeah. like I had this girl since she was pubescent and now she's 20. Like, yeah. And he gave me this like big hug, held me in for a while. And then like stepped back and like mentioned how tall I was led me into the kitchen and like offered a water or whatever. And, um, then he took me to his office and I was fucking panicked. I still remember going up to the entrance of it and it was big. It looks like a bonus room size of like a room and his desk is in one corner. He has like a couple of other couches in this other corner with like, one of the, those wall to ceiling bookshelves that has like the big TV in the middle. Uh, he had tribal music going, um, which to be noted about him, he was from Indonesia. He like grew up. I was about to ask what's up with the tribal music. So like kind of weird too, because he was literally white. Um, both of his parents were white and, obviously when you grow up as a kid in that environment, sure, you're going to do things much weirder. And he was much more open to, um, like all new age things. When of course, at the time I was just like, I don't know about this. And it's funny with the incense because like, and I'll get into this later. Like I literally have incense next to me and I've been using it all through this session. And when I stepped in there, there was this very specific incense smell that he had going where, jumping into the future, I walked into a store with my friend, not even the fucking next day. And I smelled the incense and I Joel yes. like my skin crawled. And I told my friend and she immediately took me out of uh, the shop. Um, Shit, that's a trauma response. Ooh, right, yeah. right. Our noses mm-hmm. yep. smell. They those get it. Especially um, those, those have been mm-hmm. haunting for me. So 
Um, as like an aside, the fact that I have incense, you know, next to me when I saw it so bad, it, it's been me even trying to deconstruct like that entire experience, especially from my eyes. When at that time I was like a massive Christian. Um, and now where I'm actually doing some of the things that he did and it being like from sex to smoking to whatever. And, um, where he like believed X or Y about the universe, whatever he said, I know now I relate to that more. And it has been so hard for me taking back those things that I didn't even know I was going to step into because I thought I would always be a Christian and not seeing them through the light that I had first experienced them, but see them through what is actually good and bright, not this heavy, dark, deceiving, all of those things. Um, Anyway, step into the office and I remember him pulling me into his side, um, like arm around my waist. Uh, cause again, he was seeing how tall I was. Um, Ugh. and I like, he sat down on the couch and he had like a vape or something, but he looked really stupid vaping it. Cause he looked like he was just trying to be cool and stuff. The bitch has like Brown hair. His hair's not black. No one in his family has black hair except for him and his wife. And it's because they both diet. And yeah. Um, we talked for a while. This is where things get hazy. I don't remember much. Uh, I do remember his wife coming in. I met her. I remember her eyes looking really dark. Um, and it's not, it may have been because of contacts, but there was like something else to it. Like I have always said this, I like could see them having like a red room from like 50 shades of gray. Like they'd be into the super BDSM shit. Nothing wrong with that. If someone wants to like be a part of that, but it's different being in this like darkness, this evil spirit, whatever you want to call it. That is like, this is not safe. Um, and that was kind of like the feeling you were getting there was mm -hmm. even with her presence. It was just as bad with her being there. Like I got excited when she stepped in and was like, oh, I'm not alone. The woman is in here kind of thing. I was in the chair. So like the door was behind me. Um, and she came in and talked for like 15 minutes and I was asking her questions and the just fucking energy between them was just like, word i'm like trying to like not evil but i'm like thinking never it just it was like disgusting um and something else that was always disturbing to me was how i knew he had an open relationship with his wife he never said so but it was like the vibes were so strong like even from like some of their facebook photos like halloween stuff with them with other couples and i'm like in theory, I have no problem with this. If you're going to have an open relationship or have an orgy or whatever you decide, but it felt so different with him where I again have had this difficult time reckoning with like how my beliefs have changed and yet somehow aligned with his, even though I've had this really disgusting encounter. She left and he asked her to close the door. And I was like, I like tensed up because I was like, oh, I'm not supposed to be alone. Like with him, I need to make sure the door's open so I'm safe. And the next six hours, um, we talked mainly him though, which was also disappointing to me at the time because it was like, oh, I thought I was here to talk about like your writing and you were going to ask me about my writing and what I'm doing now. And all the bitch did was talk about like how God is mother and mother is ocean. And we are all part of this big ocean, little drops in it. And like so much other shit that I don't even remember. Like I said, I blacked so much of that out. Um, uh, we get to like four hours into this and he says, Hey, let's like go get food. Um, and again, my dad and mom have been like, yeah, and just make sure you don't get in the car with him. Literally went and got the fucking car with him. Um, even though I didn't want to, which I was known in high school and college, I was so sadly horrible with listening to what felt safe to my body and going with something because I felt right. like, like kissing certain guys. I did not want to kiss them. And I kissed them back anyway, or like sleeping over with a guy and being like, I shouldn't be here, but I'm here. I am. Anyway, I got in the car. I showed him some of the music I'd written in um, high school and recorded through logic. Um, it's like all orchestral music and stuff off like quite a few times. I was often seeing him out of the corner of my eye, looking over at me. 
And at one point at a stop sign, he looks over and says, one of the derivations of you're so cute or you're cute. So we stop at um, this restaurant where like, you know, that situation with the music and him saying that and going into this restaurant, like the man is literally 60 plus years old. Like you can tell, like we are nowhere near an age. So like maybe the assumption is like, I'm his daughter, which is creepy and weird because I am literally the same age as his youngest daughter. Um, and so I'm like, I'm seeing all of these situations through those eyes of being like his daughter's age or the, you know, endearing fan. Um, but we walk into the restaurant and like the waitresses literally recognize him immediately, which was also very weird. Um, one of the waitresses who came up was like, I actually specifically requested to help your table. I've like wanted to meet you. And she looks at me and she's like, how does like, how do you get lunch with Ted Decker? And I was like, I don't know, because at that point I'm starting to shut down. I'm flooded. Like I'm uncomfortable. I just had a fucking brain dump for like four hours of like this man just talking wild shit that like, I like, as an aside, I'm like so for psychedelics. I'm so for smoking weed. And I think of someone like him where I'm like, I feel like you just smoked so much that now you're going to be perpetually like high kind of thing where like nothing was making sense, but like it was trying, it was trying too hard to make sense, which I saw. A lot that probably need to be harder than weed, but I hear you. Yeah. Yes. I mean, or there's just people who, get so much on to ego when it comes to storytelling that um, it's just a lot of shoving themselves up their own asses. And you can only do that so many times. It's like the, the movie multiplicity uh, before it all just kind of goes bad, but continue. Tell me what happens next. So I had taken a photo um, when I was at his first book signing. This is, God, it just goes back to like how pathetic I felt as a 13 year old that I wanted to touch the hands of the person who had written the stories that I love. Really, it's I'm valid. Not- we were 13. Everybody gets that. It's true. Right, right. But I'm like, I wish this would have been for like a fucking 15 year old singer, not a 60 year old man. <laughs> So, um, but I get it. I have, I have lots of patience for myself in that regard. So I, um, I show him the photo that we had taken. Um, and he grabs my hands from across the table, um, and is holding them kind of rubbing them. And he's like, how do they feel now? And, um, he kept holding them and I don't remember what he said. But then he was like, he was talking about love. I don't know. And then he was like, I love you. Do you love me? And um, yep, I I wish I could remember what else goes to that because I'm like, something's important there of why he would have said that. Still creepy as hell. We get in the car. He he makes a comment about like, yeah, you know, I think of women Mm -hmm. who just like pride themselves on being skinny. And I just wonder, you know, if you were like 20 pounds, like heavier, would you still love yourself? Was he aware of your struggles with eating disorders? Actually, I don't know. He mentioned one of his co-authors that I had also met and she remembered me. Um, he talked actually multiple times while I was with him about, he was like, yeah, me and blank, uh, talk about you. Or like, we've wondered where you were, that you were so special that you like, you know, were so wise yeah. for your age, et cetera. And I, maybe I would have mentioned the eating disorder I don't know if I'd even. That's that's okay. That's okay. But he brought up the author and uh, referenced that about beauty and weight and whatever. And I still have that internalized inside of me thinking about that. I'm sorry. Gained weight. Like, and then like, I'm, I'm welcoming and fine and happy with my body, but the amount that I've gained since I was like 18 or 20 or whatever, like I, I still remember him saying that. And it's just, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I went from a twink to a daddy throughout my divorce, just throughout like a year or two. I totally understand. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) So 
we're in the car and this is like where things became the most dicey feeling for me. And I, at this point was so emotionally flooded that I was like, just checked out. I like even stopped responding to some of the things he was saying or attempting to make longer conversation because, um, I, I was, was just like completely done. I didn't have anything left. Um, and that was just from soaking in all that shit and having to be so intensely focused. Um, I will insert my own personal trigger warning here that like, I find this like the, one of the most disgusting elements. He talked about how, you know, he's very attracted to a certain type of woman and he was on this plane one time. And like, there was this, and I'm literally using the words that he said, he's like, there was really fat black woman, you know, on the plane. And, was sitting next to her. We started talking and I was curious if I could change my preferences for what I saw in a woman. You know, could I see someone who I didn't normally think attractive, like to be attractive? And he was like, you know, by the end of the flight, I wanted to fuck her. He's like, what if I fucked her? I don't know. But like, I ran home excited to my wife you know, to tell her like, did I change my preferences or whatever? Like I was able to find someone else more attractive. And it was just like, even at that age being just like, that's so insensitive just the way that you say that uh and especially like how curt and blunt the words were and then the weird like going home to my wife and i'm like again this is where Why i'm like are you I, telling a 20 year old on top of that, that as well an, yes who's a fan of you who you don't have an actual no and i'm young as fuck mind blowing right yeah yeah um so i remember riding in the car back. Um, he moves on to talking about some pastor. I don't remember his name, um, that he was friends with and then talking about this concept of fucking God. Um, like literally like fucking him. Like and that was the egg. Ted Decker saying fuck. Yes. Yes. Like fuck. And I don't remember what else was it like? I, I wish I could remember like <laughs> where this came from and how he explained it because in, in, at the time, like it's not that it made sense. It was very confusing, but it like, it just adds to how utterly insane it was as well as telling like this like baby 20 year old. Um, he rambles about it for a bit. I'm all blacked out uh, and just, not feel, I, I'm so numb. I'm just ready to get in my car and go home. We go back to his house. My car is still parked there. He has his wife come down uh, to take photos of us. Um, I give him like a gift of one of my books. I debated even bringing it in. Okay, like, I intentionally brought it to give to him. Um, and then after all that, I was like, Oh my God, why am I doing this as I'm walking out to the car? But again, I betrayed myself and came back in anyway with it and gave it to him. I will say that's like my biggest regret with like giving that innocent part of myself away. Like, especially the innocent of like the being an author and all of that. So um he starts playing with my hair. Um, he's standing behind me and like fluffing it and everything. I have super curly hair. Um, and at the time it was also long and it's long now. And, uh, his fingers kind of like lightly, uh, go down my neck. Um, like it was absolutely like a sexual move. Um, that was not an accident. Um, and his wife mentions about him loving playing with people's hairs or people's beards because of the texture. And they always played it off because mm. he grew up in the jungles and that he was like, you know, just, he was literally raised around cannibals was like the, what his parents were uh, doing as their missionary work. Um, but I'm like, I, I didn't know what to say. I was so uncomfortable. And he came around like to in front of me and was like talking about how special I was, how I see the world and everything. And, um, him like going to what I thought was going to grab my tit. He like puts his hand on my heart. Um, and he says something about like taking like what I've had in my head like, to my heart or heart to head or whatever. And, um, 
he grabs my face with both of his hands and pulls me and me thinking he's literally about to fucking kiss me on the mouth. He kisses my forehead. Um, his wife's standing right there watching this. And, um, as an aside, I, I remember finding on Facebook years later, like different people who had gone to book signings and tagged him in them where he was also kissing them. Always women, always like mid forties looking. Um, yeah. So, uh, he walks me out to my car, gives me another kiss on my cheek as I'm hugging him. And I remember the last thing I saw was my makeup on his black shirt. Uh, and then I was gone. Um, I told my mom immediately. I told the woman I was staying with, who was a family friend, um, essentially immediately as well. Um, and, and he had told me uh, to not say anything. And ever since then, I've been like, bitch, you had the wrong girl. He said not to say anything. Can you, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, that was, he said, Oh, you know, don't say anything to anyone about this. Like, they're not going to understand. They're not normal people or like they're normal people. and We're not normal. Blah, blah, blah. And like, especially a lot of his fans who are like pretty conservative Christians. And like, obviously his stuff has always been like on the edge of like, you know, like super dark and mythic and et cetera. And like, just really out there with like thoughts and stuff. And, um, he was just meaning because like people weren't going to be ready for this. And, um, he laughed in the car and was like, better not tell anybody or anybody, or I'll have to spank you. And he was like, ha ha ha, just kidding. Oh uh, no, gross. No. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I remember being really ashamed to tell my mom that one. Um, especially yeah. Well, the fuck's I'm so off. sorry. I mean, that is so cringy and I, I feel so grossed out. And it, that makes me think that I cannot even wrap my mind around what it would have been like to hear that as a 20 year old girl in the like present. Oh, yep. I'm so grossed out. I am so sorry. Yeah, it, it was. Uh, oh damning for me in some way, um, for at least a, a, a year. Um, and then I wrote my blog post about it and I wish that the people in my life would have seen the signs and actually had done something about them to per perhaps present why he seemed this creepy and like, whatever. Um, I've had moments when I, become enraged for that girl, that kid, like, because it was just 14 year old me coming to meet him. It wasn't really my 20 year old self. 14 year old me was in that chair and 14 year old me was the one receiving these very sexualized, uh, energized comments and concepts that were completely inappropriate. Um, so when you look at it that way, it was like you had a minor sitting in the room with him. Um, even and even as a 20 year old, that's not appropriate. Those are okay. it isn't the context of your relationship with him or the way that you know him. Yep. That's not the context of your conversations or anything. That is the same with it's a situation that I've gone through or others. When it's just a oh surprise, we're gonna jump right into something physical. Mm -hmm that can sense that conversation, everything is not present. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, it's not appropriate. It's not the right context. It's not the right relationship. Exactly. Yep. That's what I've like been feeling and also saying like throughout this today is, um, it's different. It's a much different context. Um, so in the blog post, I, gave a lot of details, but even still held a lot back as I'm like ending it. I write that I had wished I had never emailed him. Um, I posted, it was in June. Um, it was like middle of June and shared it with more people. I got a lot of traction with it. In fact, a couple of people reaching out to me saying that he had read, they'd read, um, his stuff or still were reading his stuff and I had no idea was sorry. Um, 
that I saw a, an email a notification from his book team where he had a new book coming out. And this would have been in November that I would have seen this. And I happened to get a text from him on Thanksgiving of the year previous, right after everything would have happened, him checking in on me, wondering how I was doing and whatever other bullshit. And I wrote that I never responded. I hope you got the message. I think you do. And feeling that it's like, yep, you could have either seen this because you were curious about what I was doing and you went hunting for it on your own. Or at some point with me working with one of the Instagram accounts, do better church and posting the story there and talking with you, maybe the word will get around to it. I've had people ask me, am I ready for potential uh, allegations or slander libel from it? And not exactly, but I have plenty of witnesses to that time of my life who can testify to that. And I'm sure I can find the text somehow. So it's not so much trying to, you know, bury him in the dust and leave him, but it's more so wanting to bring light to the fact that like, this is dangerous. This come a lot last year, I was watching YouTube videos of him and was literally, and I've done this for years on Facebook and on websites, every couple of like six months or whatever, I look to see if like, A, he's dead, <laughs> or B, um, looking to see if like, he's made any new content or whatever, or like, eh, scandals happened, like looking for something to help me feel less alone with this one incident. Wow. Um, there's something about telling our story and hearing us, hearing it in our own voice. And there's something so empowering about that. And I, when we get back from the break, I want to touch on where you are now with feeling about this. And I mean, even now, as we talk about it on the show, um, what is it that you hope would happen? Or what is it that you um, want for yourself or for the environment or the world that we're living in? What changes do we want to see happen? Um, so let's talk about that right after this. Okay, Chuck, are you ready? Have we only have one shot? We got to make this work. Uh, wait, you didn't give just just me just read in, your in, lines. I'll oh, give you the paper. Oh, okay, okay. Psst, are you guys ready? Are you ready? Are you? All right. Ah, okay. uh, um, are you ready where, 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 to where, where, deconstruct where they, with friends? What the what the hell? Where did, where did all this come from? <laughs> deconstructing your faith it used to be you got a band? and boring wait, as hell. Wait, 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 wait. But no one must wait. deconstruct their faith alone ever again when you oh. deconstruct with friends. Um, Chuck, tell them what we mean. Um, yeah, Go. that's that's right, Brady. Yeah. Uh, the life after has a. Uh, uh, what the hell, Brady? Uh, I went full on Jamunji on this one. But keep going. He's a rental <clears throat> by the hour. The, the Life After Podcast has a secret Facebook community <laughs> and Slack yeah. channel for people deconstructing the, the uh, Christian fundamentalism and other oppressive religions. Uh, meet new people and, and, uh, and deconstruct with, with friends. friends. <laughs> nice job, Chuck. You even got the echo. Uh, thanks. Uh, that was kind of cool, I guess. Oh, God, he's touching me with his trunk. Uh, you can apply for the secret group it's on, our fa- Ooh, on our Facebook by answering three entrance questions. Your membership is hidden, and the admins keep the room constructive and helpful. Uh, now, can we get this elephant out of here? Nope, probably not, but we can. Deconstruct with friends. Welcome back to The Life After, conversations with courageous people deconstructing Christian beliefs. I'm here with Emily um, Dukes, and tell me where you are now at this situation. I I know that feelings still come up, and that's a thing that happens maybe for a long time, but that doesn't mean that there also isn't feelings of empowerment. Mm. So... I've always struggled with playing small. 
since I was a kid. I lived in an abusive home, so the only way to not get hurt was to be small. And I've struggled with an eating disorder, which my therapist mentions oftentimes, even though I never related to this until she told me that she was like, perhaps your obsession with staying, quote, small is to keep you safe. So there's there is this wow. surrounding right. theme in my life about safety. And I look at that moment as this pinnacle, probably the worst moment of like me feeling like I put myself in an unsafe position. Now I'm not blaming myself. It was not my fault. It was not my fault. The first time with that man from the church, who was the deacon, it was not my fault with Ted Decker. It was not my fault with the X amount of guys that I was with in college. Those were not my fault. What was hindering me was how I was raised to be small. And so I would go along with what was happening, especially if I was being kissed and I didn't want to be, I'd kiss the person back anyway, because I didn't know how to say no. So I've spent the last five, six years of my life working tediously and painstakingly on boundaries and on saying no. And coming to terms as well as accepting the fact that my history is made up with those moments. That does not mean my future will be that way. In fact, what I've been most proud about in the last few years of my life is being in this current relationship that I'm in, where I have confronted my partner on multiple things or have been confronted And we are able to have conversations. I'm able to communicate what feels comfortable and what doesn't, especially with being like, hey, I would prefer you to do X over Y. The the work that I've done on boundaries is big. But alongside that has come the full renouncing of Christianity, which is a phrase I never would have thought of saying even two years ago. But it's one I'm extremely proud of. I grew up a massively evangelical Christian. It started with my dislike for church and I had disliked it really for quite a few years. Um, Then I started thinking about evolution and creation. And then I started thinking about sex and being like, "Um, well, I don't feel different. In fact, I feel quite fucking empowered after that. being like, how fucking, yeah, I did that, or I made that decision, or I chose to smoke weed because of X, Y, and Z. Like, and that's what culminated into the Christianity Tower in my world tumbling down. And I watched from a distance as it did, and still am, although like it's, it's essentially, we're at ground zero at this point, and we get to rebuild. Um, <laughs> that's the yeah, thing that's yeah. very important to me in my life, is like this concept of you hit rock bottom and building back up, and knowing that the only direction that you will get to go at that point is up. So I love that. I, I really relate with that, because mm-hmm. I look at deconstruction as an act of rebellion, yeah. Um, as like an act of, of humanism of saying, okay, I'm giving myself the power back. Yeah. So it's no longer I'm doing the blind faith thing where I give you all of these like privileges um, and that you haven't deserved. And, and instead it's like going back and saying, no, I'm, I'm, look, I'm going back to things that make humans able to grow and progress and I'm taking the power of those things back to myself and for a lot of people like staying in the faith is important to them maybe for a time maybe long term but for me getting out of it was a really important declaration of independence (laughs) and then be able to kind of say like no I'm not doing this whole spiritual slave thing I'm not going to be you know, I'm not going to need a savior. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to be my own. Um, there's like a little phrase I always think of is that we are greater than I am. Uh, and, you know, like I am like Yahweh. So like, yeah, yeah. Um, and I just, I think more of like that humanistic, like togetherness is such like a act of rebellion for me. Mm. And I hear you kind of saying those same things. And part of rebellion is to talk about what happened and tell the truth of our experiences. 
I know that you had mentioned earlier kind of like some Instagram um, posts or whatever. What, how have you been able to kind of talk about this? And um, what messages would you have for others who feel like they might be in a grooming Mm. position or situation where somebody's trying to kind of get in access to them like Ted had done with you. Yeah. I didn't start out feeling brave. I felt very small. I felt very weak. I felt very incapable. Um, but something that has always been true for me, even when I was younger was I, I'm incredibly honest about where I'm at and who I am. So my, my being vocal about my depression and anxiety, that was big. I would write blog posts about it and I would write about it in a way where I had not seen many, if any, write about it like that. Because my entire goal was to help other people feel less alone and to help other people be brave by me being brave myself. So all that being said, the quote power coming from the Ted Decker experience and me writing about it, especially in a blog post, I didn't feel afraid about that. But I also recognize my own privilege in that, that I am not necessarily, or I was not necessarily exposed to someone with as much popularity as another celebrity. Um, and so I'm almost a little safer behind that, but also I told my mom within like an hour of it happening. And then I told the next person. And maybe that's also because I was just so painfully honest as a high schooler about everything that I was doing and definitely what I was not doing. Um, that maybe it just came from that, this need that I could not lie. So maybe even that in of itself, like the reason why I would have done it was like, not necessarily toxic. I just, I didn't want it in my body. And that's what I've adapted over the last few years is like, when something like that happens, when something uncomfortable happens, I don't want it in my body. I'm going to talk about it. And so then that translates into my own personal relationship or even with my family, where there are certain things that I draw hard lines with. And I say, this is not going to be talked about in this way or this tone. I will not be spoken to this way. So there's this, there's, there's been this very slow development in my pride in myself and strength to stand up. And I love that. It's, it it has cost me so much energy and so many tears um, from working in really terrible jobs and trying to stand up for myself and feeling like I'm being steamrolled um, to even like setting boundaries with work of when I'm available and when I'm not, it's, I have found one of the most helpful things for me has been keeping very small promises to myself. And that comes from listening to myself from something as simple as what do we referencing myself and I want for dinner tonight. And I slowly started learning how to feel into my body, what I wanted, because sometimes, and this is random, but sometimes I would betray myself and I'd go with the other thing because it either sounded healthier or I was afraid of the food or I just didn't know what I wanted to pick. So I picked one and then I, in my head was like, oh, I should have picked the other, but I just stay with the other. Like that whole bullshit. I have learned to be better with that and to pick things that I'm in the mood for. And then that's translated into bigger things uh, from the people that I surround myself with to um, situations I put myself in or jobs that I apply for even when it's really hard and maybe put strain on family or friends. Um, I fucking fight for myself. I and love that. Yes. I, I've had many people fight for me. I have a list of people in my mind that I can think of right now from freshman year of college to now people who have been in my corner fighting for me and cheering me on, especially when I haven't had the energy to myself. Oh God, that's the thing, right? Like, to have people come into our lives that can kind of advocate for us until we mm-hmm. have the ability to do it on our own. Yeah. And that's what therapy was for me in a lot of ways was to kind of 
get these training wheels on so that I can think in a different way that is just overall generally more healthy and more helpful. And the little things like that and in having more mindfulness of how we think to ourselves and how we speak to ourselves. I love what you said about even referring to yourself as we. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about... Um, Jamie Lee Finch. Yes, she I was about to of, say that. Oh, yeah, yeah, but yeah. she she always says, you know, like your your body is a person, yes. and and I think about that a lot as a single parent. Of, mm-hmm. um, I'm working alongside myself to help. I, I'm co-parenting with my ex as well, but whenever I've got my son, it's just me, and so. Realizing that I can trust myself to mm-hmm. be a dependable partner mm. uh, to do the important things, and that that was a a big turn in my life too, and to become my own ally. Yeah. Can we Just, fucking talk about that? The concept of trusting yourself because that's like that's fucking shot down in Christianity. You're not supposed to trust yourself. You're supposed to trust God. And like, if you have a big decision to make, you have to go pray about it instead of trusting either your gut instinct, because those are just as valid or, uh, like, you know, even consulting in people, like the people in my life, like most of those people have filtered out from the different stages of my life. I have like two, three close friends and that's it. Um, but the concept of trusting yourself trusting yourself with your body and your sexuality, your mind, everything. That is such a foreign concept for Christianity, in my opinion. Absolutely. I mean, I repressed my sexuality until I was 28 and divorced. Mm -hmm. And it was one of those things I had to rediscover. It took such a long time to be able to trust that because I had built in so many conditions, biases, and so many uh, shame avalanches and loops to run into. But once I finally, I I tell this story a lot, but the first time that I finally did anything with a guy the next morning, I I thought that I built this up in my head from age 14 to 28, that it was Mm going to be horrible and I'd feel so shameful afterwards. And, but the next morning I remember looking at myself in the mirror at his house Mm -hmm. and just feeling home Mm -hmm. in my body. And I just like gave myself this like, 1990s sitcom high five in the mirror and oh. it was just it was like a moment of victory that literally for 14 years I'd built in my head that it was going to mm-hmm. be a time of failure oh I feel for that because it was the same way yeah. with sex like I, I was mm-hmm. the kid who said I wasn't going to kiss anyone until I got married yes I, yes I, I I was giving side hugs and thought it was like I, I felt ashamed if I cuddled with someone, let alone hold someone's hand or have a crush on them. Like, and the next morning I was like, I feel so fucking empowered <laughs> because yes. I was like, first of all, it's not that big of a deal. Like it's great, but it's not this fucking shining, like pinnacle on top of this mountain that I'm like, people talk about it's the greatest shit in your life. I'm like, my God, then you're living for nothing if you think right. that because there's equal parts, so many more things like including this to make your life great. And yeah, I understand that. Well, I mean, I get what you're saying, and I feel that too, especially growing up in purity culture. It was so built up that it was like whenever you finally climaxed, that was the climax of your story. You know, it's like all this built up, and finally you were able to, like, have sex. You're like, yeah. Yeah. I I could just see, like, some Ferris Bueller's Day Off, like, he socks to the bike, you know, the (laughs) camera. It's like, and that's when I knew I was finally a man or some <laughs> bullshit yeah. like that. Yeah. And it's just, it's such a dumb, you know, trying to act all pure and chaste, but really you're centering the entire, your entire, like, culture onto the thing that you say you're avoiding, right? And that's never healthy. Mm-hmm. Um, well, tell me about what you're doing like what's next for you? What what's going on in your life? And I also know that you, you had one little last part of your blog post that you wanted uh, to end with as well. So um, let's have it. <laughs> sure. 
well, I don't fucking know what I'm doing with my life. Let's just be real. I'm 25 and I'm working two jobs at the moment, one of which is fine. Um, and I really like it. The other one I'm pretty so, so on, but I need money and money. Things just suck. And yes, everything just sucks right now, but I love where I'm living. I love where my partner and I are living. We're living in Las Vegas currently. Uh, we did not <laughs> ever see ourselves living here, but living in the West has changed so much. So all of that being said, whatever is in my future over the next few years, I want it to be out West. I honestly don't want to go back to the South actually ever. Um, I love art. I do digital and traditional art. I have since I was a kid, I wrote novels as you know, um, through high school, but I, I still love to write either like short stories or, uh, poems or whatever. Um, I am a photographer and a videographer that actually was my main role for the last like six years doing freelance work with that. So there's, there's a lot of things that are open to me and I want to do all of them. Um, that is not always easy, especially when I don't want to be confined to a nine to five all the time. Um, so yeah, I don't know what the fuck I want or what I want to do in all honesty. And I'm like, accepting that, yeah. that right now. And I'd much rather say that than be like, yeah, I've got these plans and I'm going to do this. Cause COVID just fucking proved like absolutely nothing is necessarily going to be for certain. I didn't even think this move would happen. I was expecting another variant. So that has forced me to just sit back and process. That would be another uh, moment from one of the earlier questions you asked me of like what helped me develop my boundaries. It was just literally sitting with all of the trauma for the last year through COVID and still sitting with it. Um, so that's where I'm at. <laughs> uh, and then as for the blog post, just to wrap up, um, I think I mentioned this earlier where I had forgotten half of this shit when uh, I would have first emailed the story out to people, be, that being the first time I had done that and doing that in early 2021. And then I went back and read the blog post, which it had been quite a few years since I had seen it. And I talk about how he had reached back out to me during Thanksgiving, asking how I was doing. This would have been the Thanksgiving after I met up with him. Um, I remember tensing up at that and not knowing what to do at first. And then I immediately deleted the text and never responded. Um, and whether or not he ever came onto my blog in curiosity of what I was doing with my life or, um, you know, like from some of the different stories that I've shared with more public accounts, one thing I always knew for certain he had severely underestimated me and I will always hope he knows his secrets were never safe with me. I love it. Emily, thank you so much for entrusting me with your story and sharing mm -hmm. what you went through in your experience. Um, listener, if you're going through a situation where you feel like you might be being groomed or kind of put into a, a sort of toxic relationship or situation where somebody can take advantage or manipulate you, um, please let somebody know, reach out for help. Um, also, this show, we're a huge advocate for therapy and just things that come along with that and understanding intuition and understanding our body. Emily, thank you again so much Listeners, we'll be back until next time. If you don't go to church, remember <laughs> Sunday is just the second Saturday. Mm. Thank you. This has been an episode of the Life After Podcast. Find us on Facebook for our secret online community. Find our merch on T Public, monthly contributions on Patreon, and don't forget to rate and review the show on iTunes.
used to hate myself Congratulations, you played yourself Out of mental health and living in self Speak for yourself, your marriage not a testimony Don't believe the church is a bribe But she owe me alimony I'm a pony up and stick a feather in your ceremony Wearing weddings out, I call it Yankee Doodle Matrimony And I'm only getting started, my tongue is fire Fighting gaslighting leaders like your ways are not higher I don't need a choir to bring down the entire empire You threw the gasoline, I'm just spitting matches through the wire I'm just trying to break them free, make them see The refrains and mental chains of slavery I disagree with any preacher, teacher, not on defeat I repeat, I don't need a church to walk in victory I'm complete And everybody say Go, 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 go.